This is Working for the Word, and I'm Andrew Case. move to this uh, final leg of the uh, Greek imprecisions being some instances where the internal precision of Greek marking different features ends up being imprecise. So I find this an important category as I think about imprecisions in Greek, because if, if people who argue that Greek is precise point to these features like marking of case and number and gender and saying, Greek is precise because it does this. Um, it's, it's significant to me that there's instances where marking those things actually makes it imprecise. So uh, first example here is from Colossians. Um, in, in Colossians 2, 13 through 15, you know, Paul is kind of wrapping up a section here and talking about how you were dead in your transgressions, and then God takes your sins and he nails them to the cross, putting uh, the authorities and the rulers to open shame. And it ends with a phrase, triumphing over them. And then in Greek, it's in ofto. And I say that in Greek significantly because in ofto here, it's a prepositional phrase, n with a pronoun ofto, it's marked for dative case, singular number, but it could be masculine or it could be neuter. So two different genders share the same form. So there's an imprecision in Greek's very precise marking form. But more relevantly here, there's two possible masculine singular antecedents that it points back to. And Paul just throws out in it as though it's obvious which one it is. So earlier on, there's cross. Uh, Paul talks about in, at the end of 14, nailing it to the cross. And then there's also the he kind of floating throughout here being Jesus. So it's possible as the English Standard Version takes it to finish this passage by triumphing over them in him, namely in Jesus, or as the NIV takes it, triumphing over them by the cross. What we've got Right. Is, is that a big, profound theological difference? Well, no, not really. But it is from a Greek level pointing out Greek has all these complicated morphological transformations of words, but you still end up with situations where it's not clear what the antecedent of a pronoun happens to be. Even with all of the, the case, the numbers, the genders, yeah. you still run into instances where it's just not clear. Right? There's two possible meanings here, and Paul does not disambiguate between them. Um, another example from, again, a letter of Paul from Ephesians 2.14, or here's an example where there's a whole chunk in the middle, kind of at the end of 14 and at the beginning of 15, where it's not clear at all where exactly it fits. So even with the case number gender markings, it's not clear where it belongs. And you'll see this in different English translations that this parts of this end up appearing in different verses, depending on how you understand it relating to the, uh, the rest of the context. The, the, the two pieces that don't have an obvious home in that passage are the Greek words for the enmity and the Greek words for in or by his flesh. And this is where Paul is talking about Jesus is our peace. He has made us one, has broken down the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles. There's three different ways to understand how these relate to the context, and they're all represented in different English translations. Now, when we translate it into English, you have to take one of the above routes. You can't leave it ambiguous because it doesn't really work. Whereas in Paul's writing, it's just there. It's marked as an accusative, so we know it has to have some sort of accusative function. And yet, it's not clearly differentiated what participle it belongs to. Should it belong to the one in verse 14, or should it belong to the one in verse 15? Or should parts of these two phrases belong to one or the other? And in this case, it would actually have some, some theological implications for how we understand the role of the law in redemptive history and, and how Paul talks about the law. So again, this is just a, it's an instance where 
case marking, gender marking, number marking, which are so neat from the perspective of English speakers, don't actually give us clarity as to what the Greek is intended to mean. Would it be possible to read those three different translations and point out those differences? Yes. So the English standard version, so it's two verses. So chapter two, verses 14 and 15. Um, So I'll read the whole of them and hopefully that shows just for a little bit of context. So for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, after you get to that part, it's clear again. In the NASB, so the New American Standard, it reads like this, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, comma. And now we've got the phrase that is in verse 14, in the Greek text, but is now in verse 15 in this English text, by abolishing in his flesh the hostility, which the law composed of commandments expressed in ordinances. So here we've got hostility is equated to the law, as opposed Mm. to an ESV, hostility is part of the dividing wall. Okay. And the last way to take it is in the, uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the HCSB, For he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility, period. In his flesh, he made of no effect the law consisting of commands, et cetera, et cetera. So here we put the dividing wall of hostility is in one sentence. And then the next prepositional phrase in his flesh is part of a new sentence. So the first one, the SV takes the two phrases in question as belonging to the participle in verse 14. The NASB takes both phrases as belonging to the participle in verse 15. And the HCSB takes one phrase to each participle. Okay. That's helpful. So it yeah. splits them around. And there's right, there's there's some theological significance. Is the law, is Paul portraying the law as hostile, as hostile, as part of the hostility between Jews and Gentiles? Or is he emphasizing that there's a dividing wall of hostility, which involves the law, but he's not saying the law is hostile. So there's clearly hostility, but is the law, it, to, to what way is the law related to the hostility? I guess is the question here. Yeah. And different ways of construing the Greek result in different sentences in English, but that's not because it's random interpretations. That's because the Greek syntactically is unclear. Now, it may have been obvious to Paul and his first readers how it's to be related. It may have been. I mean, I don't know. To us today, it's certainly not obvious. And there's good grammatical reasons to argue why it was probably not obvious to people throughout history as well. In, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, this, this verse pertains to who does the work of the ministry. So, it starts off, and God gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So there's three prepositional phrases in verse 12, for the, for the, for the. That's how we will translate them in English. The issue here is how do these three prepositional phrases relate to each other? And there's two possible understandings. First is that all three clarify the purpose of why God gave the church shepherds and teachers. So on this view, they all explain the work of the ministry, which the church leaders are to fulfill. So God gave church leaders for number one, preparation of the saints, number two, for the work of the ministry, and number three, for building up of the body. So that's one view. The second view is that the first prepositional phrase clarifies the purpose of why God gave the the church shepherds and teachers. And then the next two explain the goal of that first prepositional phrase. So in, in this understanding, God gave the church shepherds and teachers for um, preparing for building up the saints. And the reason that they are to prepare the saints is so that the saints carry out the work of the ministry and the building up of the body of Christ. 
both of these are possible ways to understand the Greek, and both have been advocated for as far back as we can tell in church history. So they're, they're both old, they're both possible understandings of the Greek, and Paul quite easily could have disambiguated what he meant. He sure. could have quite easily have said, God gave pastors so that they do X, Y, and Z, or God gave pastors so they build up the body, and then the body does the work of the ministry. How you understand this verse will have implications as to how you understand church offices to function in church and this kind of the structure of churches. And again, it's right ambiguous. It's a point where there could have been, easily could have been clarity in Greek where there's not. And then just one final one from 1 Peter 3, 14, here about uh, the mood in Greek that we call the optative mood, the verbal mood. And we could translate this, but if you do suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And the question here is the, 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 the word suffer here, the verb suffer is in the optative mood. Now, we know in the history of Greek that the optative mood was dying as a normally used category in this period of Greek. It shortly after becomes extinct, functionally extinct. So that in modern Greek, there's only a couple of fossilized phrases that still use optative forms. It, it becomes a defunct verb form. Yeah. Um, and could you maybe define optative for those who may not be familiar? Yes, I was just about to do that. So Perfect. <laughs> the optative is the optative is difficult to define for a variety of reasons. In the in New Testament times, optative is primarily limited to expressing wish. So the, the most famous optative in the New Testament is where Paul says, me yenuto, which we usually translate as by no means. It's also used for greetings, like may grace and peace be with you. Uh, may you be filled with things. So it it's generally in the New Testament limited to expressing wishes, and it can also be used in prayers and, and things like that. In this case, it's in a uh, in a conditional sentence. So now in classical Greek, there would be a specific nuance of this sort of conditional, which would indicate Peter does not expect it to happen, but it's an outside possibility that they might suffer. So that's one understanding of it in terms of traditional classical Greek meaning of the optative in this construction. That suffering is unlikely in their current situation, but possible. Now, it's also possible in terms of Koine Greek grammar that Peter's not intending this to seem like an outside possibility, that they will suffer, but maybe suggesting when exactly or how much or how often is, is uncertain. And the, the big problem that we have is we don't know what status the optative verbal mood has for Peter and for his audience. We know it's dying, but we don't know. Now, it could be that it was not vague for them, but it certainly is a vague part of Greek for us as we read it. And that's an important distinction because we don't read Greek as first century native or near native fluency speakers of Greek. Right? We read it 2,000 years removed. And how clearly we can understand what Greek is communicating is limited by that fact. And so regardless of how precise certain facets of Greek actually are, there's certain realities that limit our understanding of them as we read it today. And that goes for people who believe that Greek is super precise as well. It may have been super precise, but there's certain facets of it that we just don't know, right? We just can't know exactly what's going on. And having laid all that out, I want to kind of come back full circle. It's just a brief kind of summary thought. You know, there's a lot more that could be said, a lot more specific examples that could be given of any of these different categories of imprecision. What it comes down to is the claim that Greek is super precise it's just not a defensible claim, right? Greek is a language. It has some areas where it's precise. It has some areas where it's vague. We could find examples of both. Um, it is different than English. Yes, it is different than any other language because it's its own beast. What these people who are claiming that Greek is super precise are usually doing, in my view, and from what I can tell, is they're actually trying to bolster some sort of theological pre-commitment that they have. And I, I think that there's two big theological reasons 
behind why people argue this and why people want to believe it. So why it hangs around, like in my instance, I somehow came across this view, though I grew up in a church where no one knew any Greek. And somehow I got this idea that Greek is super precise. And, and part of it, I think, is there's an argument cinching power. So on occasion, there's passages where you can appeal to precise rules of Greek grammar, which support a certain interpretation. Now, the interpretation may be perfectly correct, but the Greek rule ap appealed to doesn't actually cinch the argument. You, you might call that lazy exegesis, right? A desire for certitude rooted in the forms of the Greek language when the forms of the Greek language don't actually lend that certitude. And some great yeah. examples of, of this have been categorized in a uh, an article by a scholar, Frank Stagg, called the article, The Abused Aorist, and <laughs> categorized a bunch of instances in, in prominent commentaries where commentators appealed to a, a, the aorist as conveying a certain idea where it, it just doesn't, that's not what the aorist in Greek does, the aorist being a roughly like a simple past tense in Greek. It's just not how it works. Um, your theology, your interpretation may be correct, but it's not correct because of the grammatical rule that you're appealing to. Um, but especially from a pulpit, sort of appeal to Greek lends an air of decisive authority. And it's significant because what follower of Jesus doesn't want a precise and clear message backed up by the clear meaning of the Greek text in the New Testament? Sure. It, it, it has a lot of power within the context of the church. And then I, I think the other reason I look at as to why this view hangs around is that it's a, it's a theologically comforting plank in the bigger complex of the doctrine of God's word that we have. Um, mm -hmm. And this is where I think most people fall in their ideas about Greek, especially the people who don't know Greek at all. It's comforting to believe that God's message is clear, decisive, precise, and that any difficulties we have stem from the inadequacies of our inadequacies of our translation and don't originate in ambiguities in the original. You know, what I would what I would counsel and as I think about this is it's important not to give people the idea that Greek is magic because it's not, it's a language. Um, it's subject to the same sorts of limitations that all languages are subject to. And we don't ultimately want people to come to put their faith in a magical idea about Greek, but to come to put their faith in the God who is revealed and who reveals himself in his word. So I think this whole like precision idea, Greek as super precise is, is just a wrong headed way of trying to do a good thing, right? Well, we up people's faith in, in the validity and clearness and communicative power of their New Testament. Um, but it's a wrong way to do that. It's a misleading way to do that because yeah. it's, it's frank, frankly wrong. Yeah. I remember that, well, in my experience, there's been a lot of things you see in Christianity with these sort of good intentions, the good intention of bolstering people's faith or confidence, but ultimately misleading. I can think of one, you know, even the the issue of creationism. <laughs> There's been some some terrible things that have been done, even outright lies, to bolster people's confidence in a creator, but at the same time muddying the waters. That's one thing I I, I think is so so tragic for a lot of people because at the end of the day, you end up hurting them more than helping them when they find out the truth. Yeah. And I can say like one of the parts of my personal journey. So I've been, you know, gone through seminary now I'm at the tail end of a uh, doctoral studies is kind of working through how I maintain my faith when a lot of the things that I was taught or led to believe in the past I've learned are simply wrong. Right. Or, yeah. or are not viable ways sure. of explaining what we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so, I, uh, as you said, it, it's better to be clear on the front end rather than to uh, mm -hmm. let people find out on the tail end that they've been misled. Yeah, yeah. It really erodes trust and confidence at the end of the day instead of helping. 
I, I find it really interesting that Greek tends to be put in this category of scientific precision, maybe you could say magical precision or exactitude, whereas Hebrew then gets <laughs> distorted into a mystical language of hidden meanings and that, mm-hmm. you know, things that you need to discover underneath maybe a Bible code or, uh, you know, something to do with the Paleo Hebrew, you know, hieroglyphic sort of characters and <laughs> figure out the meaning from those, yeah. you know, all sorts of things that get thrown around. But uh, it, at the end of the day, as you say, it's a lot of lazy exegesis of, of wanting to give yourself some kind of some kind of supernatural confidence instead of finding it in the right place. Like from an English speaking perspective, Hebrew is just bizarre. Right. <laughs> um, bizarre. That's- and then vague. A website I was reading as I was thinking about this was the guy was making the argument that the Septuagint is part of almost like a prophetic preparation of Jesus's coming because it fixes the vagueness of Hebrew oh, into boy. the precision of Greek as sort of like a parallel of the shadow of Jesus in the Old Testament becoming the reality in the new. And just, I mean, there's so much wrong with that, Yeah. Um, but, but just showing the, the perspective that this person has, and that a lot of people share that Hebrew is vague. Mm-hmm. And so it's like a limited communicative tool that God adjusted himself to, yep. whereas Greek is super precise. And so that's where God gives the best of his revelation because Greek was ready for him at that time. Right. Yeah. And that argument goes all the way back to the church fathers. I'm reading, a, I was just reading a book on Jerome where Augustine corresponded with Jerome over years trying to yeah. convince him not to do his new translation based on the Hebrew. He said that yeah. the Septuagint is superior. And so many people thought that way. It was basically like a KJV only, you know, with, but with the Septuagint, but to the level of exalting it above the original Hebrew, which is yeah. so crazy to think about, but it was big. Yeah. And then for the church fathers, basically none of them knew Hebrew. Right. So you've got yeah. that going for them. The, the Old Testament for them was the Septuagint. There was no other, there was no access to anything else. Yeah. And then just, I mean, in, in their context, I think it's fair to remember that we're, I mean, we're 2000 years removed and we're very comfortable with the idea that Judaism and Christianity are different things. And for them, that was a very different situation. Sure. Like that they were in, in very real exegetical battle, if you were, over who is the actual heirs to the Old Testament promises. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and so, I mean, there's a lot of things we can look back and say that they were wrong on, or, or they were at least extremely uncharitable to the Jews in the way they talked about and debated with them. And yet, you know, part of it is just being fair that they were also in a very different place mm-hmm. in terms of what they were doing and had to do. Well, this has been absolutely delightful. Thank you so much for all the work you put into this. It's been really helpful, and I think it's going to be enlightening for a lot of people and clarifying. Appreciate it. Happy to do it. It's been a lot of fun. (laughs) 